Okay, I think we're gonna um, I think we're gonna kick this off. I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody and really thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. I want to welcome those that are joining from Kiev, but those who are also joining um, on the other side of the Atlantic as well. Uh, today we're we're focused uh, on a uh, a conversation on what we we build as Russian aggression uh, in eastern Ukraine. I could add Crimea to that as well, um, and uh, no doubt, um, this is a one of the uh, areas in focus for those who are in Washington, the Biden administration, European allies and partners, of course, for Ukraine, um, with deep concern about the military buildup, which has been taking place over the last several weeks, uh, and which earlier, um, even in this week, we've seen uh, the U.S. Uh, White House spokesperson say is the largest military buildup. Uh, since 2014. So my name is Jonathan Katz. I am the I'm a senior fellow, but also director of democracy initiatives at the German Marshall Fund in Washington. Uh, I'm also uh, the co-chair of uh, the Transatlantic Task Force on Ukraine, um, TTFU, um, along with other colleagues, uh, both here in Washington, in Kiev, and in Brussels. And I think we're really, um, really pleased to have two speakers uh, who came in. We appreciate uh, both Taras and Maria, you both coming in um, really at the, you know, with short notice uh, to speak to a situation on the ground uh, that is of, of great concern. Both of you have been commenting and writing about it over the last couple of weeks and up until today. Um, and, and so we really value your participation and willingness to join us. Uh, we're going to be talking, obviously, about the, the current situation, um, which isn't something that just happened out of the blue. I think I, we have to keep reminding ourselves how um, how this situation was started um, and the role of, of Russia in this, particularly the role of uh, support for those that separatists that are in the Donbass, um, a legal seizure of Crimea, and uh, the real threat that exists um, on uh, to Ukraine, but also uh, to the West. And I think not lost in all this, I know our speakers will be will be discussing this. And I also want to bring in my colleague, Elena Prokopenko, who I want to thank so much for helping pull this together. Uh, but there's also a number of issues internally that are happening in Russia itself, um, that um, including an upcoming election of September. I know others will touch on this. Um, also the health of Mr. Navalny, which has been deteriorating in prison. Um, it's not lost that, that Russia internally, uh, there's some challenges, uh, deep challenges for, for Mr. Putin uh, and deep uh, challenges for him to maintain power at all costs. And of course, uh, the deep concern is that Ukraine is in the crosshairs, uh, potentially uh, because Putin wants to stay in power, destabilize Ukraine as he has sought to do for many years um, and I think we're at a crossroads, but clearly of concern to everybody, or you wouldn't be seeing the type of interaction that we have seen over the last week between uh, top U.S. officials and Ukrainian officials, including uh, President Zelensky, uh, President Biden, uh, but on down, on down the line, and including uh, what you're seeing from European allies, including the reported conversation that took place between Angela Merkel uh, the German Chancellor and Mr. Putin, where uh, it is reported that she said that and urged him to move uh, military from the border. Uh, and I understand that, you know, I, I know there's been some questions about how the Europeans are approaching it. I do think that they understand uh, from what I'm seeing the threat here um, and certainly want to cool down uh, the potential uh, for continued violence, which is happening. Uh, I think there's been 25 Ukrainians. Uh, soldiers who've been killed since the beginning of the year. Um, this is a hot conflict. Um, and so uh, I think all eyes are on uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, but I think there should be no um, contention about who is pushing this issue uh, for the reasons, there's multiple reasons, which I think people have, have, have offered, uh, but that's for our guests today to speak to these issues and to help us walk us through really uh, where we are today how we got here and what things may look like going forward. 
So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Elena Prokopenko. Elena, thank you so much. It's great to have you as a colleague, um, bringing tremendous amount of experience, uh, partnership working with you. We're really uh, just great to have you and have your leadership. Thank you for or helping to organize and, and leading this, this conversation today. I'm going to send it over to you in, in Kiev just to both introduce our speakers and, and maybe provide a little perspective on your side uh, for how things are being viewed from, from Kiev. So over to you, uh, Alain. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for these extremely kind words. Dear colleagues, thank you for taking the time to join us today and welcome uh, to this briefing on what is arguably uh, one of the hot button topics on both sides of the Atlantic right now. Um, in the midst of the third wave of the pandemic, when Ukraine is now number one in Europe by spreading of COVID-19, it is unfortunately facing extraordinary challenges on the security front too. Uh, the recent ceasefire that had been observed in Ukraine since uh, for almost six months um, was the longest one since the start of the Russian aggression in 2014. And uh, understandably, almost uh, a third of Ukrainians named this ceasefire among the government's uh, major achievements of 2020. Uh, however, over the past few weeks, as most of you know, Ukraine's Donbass has seen uh, the largest escalation of the past years. As Jonathan said, uh, at least 25 uh, Ukrainian servicemen have been killed, including five only this week. Um, Ukrainian intelligence is warning that Russia may be preparing for large scale provocations, including the possibility of sending its troops to Ukraine's government controlled territory. Uh, given these developments, the new uh, peace plan that was announced by President Zelensky's office in early March as a joint effort by Ukraine, Germany and France seems stalled uh, and um, an urgent meeting of the trilateral content group um, on Donbass, which Ukraine convened uh, earlier this week, did not result in any kind of uh, agreement on the resumption of the ceasefire. Um, we are grateful for the decisive US and European response to this escalation that uh, Jonathan partly touched upon including from President Biden. And based on the strength of this response alone, we can see that this is not uh, merely another tension uh, like one of the many we have witnessed over the past seven years. Uh, still, uh, the question remains, what is this? Is this uh, Kremlin's attempt to derail the new round of the peace talks? Uh, does this escalation have anything to do with the recent banning of pro-Russian propaganda TV channels in Ukraine? Um, is this an attempt by Putin to distract Russians from uh, domestic challenges ahead of the September uh, parliamentary election, or maybe is this rather a test of the US and transatlantic partners response uh, now that the Biden administration is in place? Uh, what is this massive escalation signaling and, and why now? Um, there are clearly more questions than answers as we can see, and we're extremely glad to have with us today our distinguished speakers who I hope will help, help us navigate the situation we're in and will shed some light on the many questions that still remain unanswered. And without further ado, I would like to introduce them. Um, our first expert today is Maria Zolkina. She is a political analyst at the Democratic Initiatives Foundation and a frequent contributor to various Ukrainian and foreign media on the developments in Donbass, including BBC News Ukraine, Radio Liberty, and Ukrainska Pravda. In her research, Maria is focusing on the state policy towards the occupied and pre-frontline territories and the issues of Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic integration. We're also happy to have with us today, Dr. Taras Guzo, who is a political science professor at the National University of Kiev um, uh, Mohila Academy and a non-resident fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns uh, Hopkins University. Dr. Kuzo is uh, the author of countless publications on uh, post-communist and Ukrainian politics, democratic transitions and European studies. Uh, particularly among his works are the book, Putin's War Against Ukraine and the Sources of Russia's Great Power Politics, Ukraine and the Challenge to the European Order uh, and I would like to uh, address my fir first question to Maria. Uh, Maria, you have recently wrote on the potential implications of the new peace plan to be discussed uh, in the Normandy format, which was proposed, uh, which proposed to update the Minsk agreements. Um, what does this plan foresee and what is Ukraine's uh, latest strategy regarding Donbass? Is there a consistency and proper coordination between uh, President Zelensky, his inner circle, uh, the Ukraine's military leadership when it comes to achieving peace in Donbass? And do you think this new plan is still, 
it's still worth to consider it at the moment as an option after it has been leaked to the Russian media and with the current level of tension in the East. Can we still uh, consider this plan being on the table? Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Jonathan, for your in introduction. Uh, regarding the, the plan which was proposed, actually, or which uh, was developed first by, by Berlin and Paris in the uh, Normandy 4 format. So this, this is not the first attempt to push, actually, the progress forward within um, Normandy format in order to have Minsk agreements implemented. But in the second half of 2020, uh, all the attempts, they were like in a political or diplomatic deadlock, because after the ceasefire or or the agreement on the ceasefire from July back to July 2020, Russia expected and insisted actually to have some political compromises, wide ones, on the side of Ukraine in response to Russia's agreement to the ceasefire. So that was the logic, uh, completely um, um, different one from how Ukrainian side have seen at that point of time why the ceasefire was needed. Like while for Ukrainian side, the ceasefire was the first security step on the long security track. For Russia's, Russian side, it was already enough to to go to switch to political compromises. And when nothing happened, actually, I mean those political concessions or compromises. Uh, our partners from Berlin and from Paris, they started looking for some kind of the common ground. So the first attempt to develop some plan for uh, implementation of Minsk agreement, some new plan, uh, it was it took place within Minsk trilateral contact group, but uh, ended up with nothing because uh, Russia didn't present its own proposals there, but tried to do it to, uh, by the hands of uh, so-called republics and Ukrainian side uh, didn't make Russia actually um, recognize that this is Russia's plan. But after all, we have seen or there was the develop, there was developed uh, development of uh, so-called clusters. Uh, Honestly speaking, clusters presented clusters for implementation of Minsk agreements presented by uh, together by Paris and Berlin. Uh, they are actually some kind of uh, copy paste of Minsk two of the complex of measures to for implementation of the first Minsk documents. So nothing uh, radically new is presented there, though there are some uh, strong arguments or strong emphasis which should be taken into account. First of all, it's much more stronger uh, emphasis on the approach that security should come first and that, for instance, the ceasefire uh, shouldn't be dependent on any political compromises or any other humanitarian or political steps. So ceasefire, stable and long-term one is a condition, uh, is a precondition for everything. This is a much more stronger signal which comes from um, German and French clusters. The second important signal is uh, related to the idea that all the most important documents and all the uh, agreements, they should be not only developed, but they should be recognized and signed by leaders of the Normandy Four. And this is also a signal as of now, because during 2020, Russia has made a lot of efforts in order to decrease significantly the role of Normandy 4 and to redirect all the negotiations from Normandy format to Minsk TCG, where Russia consistently plays or tries to play the role of a mediator, but not of a party of the conflict, trying to push Ukraine for the direct dialogue with uh, invited representatives of, of occupying administrations from Donbass. Uh, and uh, but there are also some, um, let's say, not very pleasant ideas, but nothing new. Again, in this plan, for instance, that uh, the control over the border Ukraine shouldn't receive before the elections, though some kind of control should be um, uh, should be applied, should be organized by um, uh, SMM or SCE. This is how basically the clusters proposed by Germany and France looks like. They actually repeat uh, all the uh, known from Minsk II document. Uh, but at the same time, the strategy of Ukraine actually, which has started changing in 2020, uh, it has on the one hand led to that kind of political deadlock within negotiations. Uh, it has 
uh, led to some extent to the uh, decrease of interest on the side of Russia in order to continue the ceasefire because Russia is not interested in that without political concessions on the side of Ukraine. And at the same time, Ukrainian side has developed or has presented how it looks, how it, um, uh, it um, imagine its own strategy for negotiations and for integration of these territories uh, in its proposals to these clusters. And I have to say that though there are some, of, of course, uh, weak places in Ukrainian proposals, generally speaking, it's rather adequate starting point for negotiations. For instance, there is the logic that security is first, uh, ceasefire is a precondition for everything, exchange of, pre of prisoners is also a precondition for everything, but at the same time, uh, every political step, namely development and adoption of any piece of legislation regarding Donbas and so-called special status for it, should be dependent on the progress on the security track. This disarmament and disengagement and withdrawal of forces starts, so uh, development of the law of the of the pieces of legislation starts. If there is a progress with all these security and uh, demilitarization steps, then uh, the law is registered within the parliament and and up to full disarmament, uh, full demilitarization of the region, full uh, withdrawal of foreign forces. Uh, and everything at on the very top of uh, all this process, there will be uh, actually adoption in the second reading of all the pieces of legislation. So this is the logic how Ukrainian side tried to connect the idea of the compromise, which is seen by Germany and France, to connect political and security steps uh, all together, but at the same time to be able to stop the process at any point of time if security uh, doesn't show the security track doesn't show any progress. Uh, though there are, of course, some weak places in this in this plan. For instance, it is not very clear what will be with so-called public militia, uh, because uh, if uh, the, for instance, disarmament and withdrawal of Russian forces is not completed, so it means that uh, all these guys from um, from illegal military formations they can. Uh, easily turn into so-called public militia, like public police, let's say. Uh, so this is the, 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 the separate issue. Another, another challenge is that uh, mandate of SMM OSC, because um, comparing different missions which um, can be considered, you, it seems that Ukrainian side, Ukrainian negotiators are more in favor for uh, broadening the mandate of SMM OSC rather than to start the story with United Nations um, uh, international contingent, uh, international mi mission. Uh, but at the same time, SMM we see also needs a consensus of all the members, including Russia and all the political friends of Russia and uh, uh, all that. But radical, radically important position from Ukrainian proposals to clusters was that uh, control over the border should be returned to Ukrainian state before elections, also incrementally, also in relation to the to all other security and uh, political steps. But on the day of elections, there should be Ukrainian officers along the border. That's that's the point. Russian proposals were completely different. So and they they were much uh, they included much broader demands on the side of Ukraine than even in all the Minsk documents. And, and that's why in this situation, when there is like uh, almost no room for compromise, I mean, uh, comparing to the uh, opposite propositions of uh, two parties, uh, the story was like that, uh, that, that, that Russia starts, in my opinion, uh, um, returning to usual instruments of making pressure on, on its vis-a-vis, -vis, actually. So the military ones. So if there is no diplomatic, um, if there is no effect of uh, diplomatic negotiations, so Russia usually always appeal to military escalations, but as of now, there was a different situation because uh, there was the ceasefire, 
uh, from which Ukrainian state benefited a lot by having the escalation on the front line. Uh, and Russia also, to some extent, diplomatically benefited from it because it was uh, appreciated, let's say, by the West and by Ukrainian side as well, that Russia is at least trying not to have the same level of hostilities like before. Uh, and there was the problem how to end up with the ceasefire without being uh, actually blamed for, for, for this. Uh, and that's why incremental escalation starts. Uh, that's why the propaganda starts blaming Ukrainian side and preparing public opinion in temporary occupied territories in Crimea, in Russia itself, for so-called attack on the side of Ukraine, though there was no such signals inside Ukraine that the Ukrainian army is not um, trying to, to uh, let's say, have a military operation on the temporary occupied territories. No, it um, that's not true. Uh, but at the same time, so uh, all this um, deterioration uh, along the border between Ukraine and Russia, all this military equipment, everything was supported by a huge informational campaign. And th by this means, on the one hand, it was, it, it creates the basis for hypothesis or for an assumption that this logic might be might uh, start the scenario of a full-fledged aggression or let's say new wave of, of aggression but at the same time another scenario is still possible that russia tries to use it like a military operation with political um, um goals in order to let's say have intimidation of the west to test limits of the possible when it comes to Biden administration, the limits of the possible uh, support to Ukraine when it comes to European Union, uh, to prevent some kind of um, uh, agreement between um, US on the one hand and the European Union on the other, uh, because diplomatically position of um, of the Washington seems to be much stronger than the position of uh, European uh, countries, uh, even uh, the most involved in uh, um, attempts to res resolve the conflict. And that's why uh, Russia tries to, to create the situation of intimidation of Zelensky in order to create the room for compromise. Uh, but as of now, the situation is not like in 2014. On the one hand, diplomatic, political defense and financial reaction of Ukrainian partners uh, abroad, mainly of the US, uh, might, uh, can be completely different from the reaction in 2014 when everything was a piece of news for, for the whole world. As of now, everyone gets to know what can be expected from Russia. Uh, and all these demonstrative, let's say, campaign with demonstrative messages, they, it, it's not only from Russian side, but we have noticed, and this is positive for Ukrainian, for, for Ukrainian state, that, for instance, Washington or Berlin, they try also to make demonstrative messages, to give demonstrative messages to Moscow, that Ukraine will not be alone diplomatically, financially, and to, to some extent from defense um, capacities point of view as well, if escalation starts. So as of now, I, I think that there are set of conditions uh, um, with, without which <coughs> without which Russia will not stop will not start uh, the full fledged aggression. Uh, if Russia doesn't see any prospects for huge defense support. I don't mean uh, simply saying uh, like uh, American or someone else army on the Ukrainian territory, but for instance, ships sent to the uh, our Black Sea, um, or for instance, the prospect that, you, that the sky uh, above Ukraine will be um, uh, will be supported and will be safe due to su uh, su support from, from our uh, partners. All these conditions or all these steps can influence position of Russia when Russia decides to start full-fledged aggression or not, because this will not uh, actually aim only Ukrainian side. If there will be no um, support and Russia will be uh, will understand that it will be only the problem of Ukraine and no one will uh, create significant portion of uh, uh, of efforts uh, with Ukraine, so it will be easier for Russia to start some kind of escalation. For what we have to be ready 
is for escalation in and along the front line in Donbass. So it started and it won't be stopped. <coughs> That's we have uh, returned actually to hot position in war. Uh, this is the new reality, the new normal again. Uh, but the question of direct new wave of aggression, for instance, from uh, other uh, violation of the, of the border of Ukraine from other regions, uh, Sumy, Kharkiv, or some operation from Crimea. This is also, in my opinion, under the question, and a lot will depend on uh, readiness of Ukrainian army, on uh, um, strong or not strong position of Ukrainian leadership. And this, the, and in this regard, <coughs> the unity between political leadership and military one, is the thing which uh, which is really needed because there were problems uh, and this is not like uh, something new. I mean the problems between the inner circle of uh, Zelensky and um, um, representatives of uh, Ukrainian army, so the leadership of the army. But as of now, it seems that uh, all these issues, they started being solved and under there, let's say, this uh, danger coming from, from uh, external um, uh, external um, surrounding. Here, I think I will stop because I don't know <laughs> how, how how long have I been talked already. But I am open for any questions or clarifications. Uh, thank you so much, Maria, for this comprehensive analysis. Uh, um, I would also like you to comment, if possible, on the key Russian narratives that the propaganda uh, ch TV channels are circulating in order to sell the full-fledged war with Ukraine to the domestic uh, population, I mean, to, to the Russian population, to the, uh, yeah, to, to the consumers of this uh, disinformation. Uh, from what we can see uh, in the official statements of the Russian government, it again portrays Ukraine as the one escalating the situation and presenting Russia as the one having no other way but to protect and to defend um, Russian citizens in Ukraine's uh, east. Is this really the central narrative and are there more? Uh, yes, for Russian media, this is really the central narrative, and uh, Russia have um, uh, have been using the argument now, an argument created by Russia uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, passportization of uh, the people in Donbas, though the danger is coming not only in Donbas or around the Donbas, uh, uh, but at the same time, as of now, Russia officially uses this argument that there are our citizens, and uh, we can start protecting them. Uh, but at the same time, I think that this uh, idea will not actually persuade any of uh, civilized, uh, any actor within civilized uh, Western world about the actually um, uh, justify uh, um, about justifying uh, Russia's in, um, invasion in uh, or a new wave of invasion into uh, um, Ukrainian territory if even if Russia uh, officially do it for under the temporary occupied territory of Donbas but there is also one scenario that uh, can be used by Russia uh, this is the scenario of um, uh, explaining um, the entrance of the regular army of Russia into temporary occupied Donbas uh, with the argument that they are the uh, peacekeepers. Uh, but this is uh, th this scenario is also an important one, and we should consider it because this is the story um, rather simple to what has happened in Transnistria or in Georgia, uh, or to some extent with Nagorno Karabakh. Though the Armenia was uh, um, gave an agreement for 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 such a role of Russia, nevertheless. Um, uh, so the one of the um, scenarios we should be actually ready for is also this one. But at the same time, um, I would say that from our experience of uh, making interviews, they are not representative one. Uh, but this is like set of interviews in order to catch up some tendencies in temporary occupied of Donbas. So people are not so ready to accept all the messages of Russian propaganda. Uh, and uh, this is, might be a very simple answer, but um, um, President Zelensky is not accepted by the people, by a lot of people, I would say, in the temporary occupied Donbas as, let's say, so bloody leader. 
uh, ready to to start some military operation and his let's say image to a some extent help to decrease or to new, neutralize um, this kind of um, sentiments or this kind of public moods in temporary occupied zones. But of course, there are a lot of people who still are uh, in, in, in such a um, the, um, tension, um, situation under the political tension. And these uh, messages of Russian propaganda are true. Uh, and this is something which is specific one, because military maneuvers like we have now, they were not the same, but pretty the same during previous periods. Even in 2020, there were also some uh, military trainings, like now Russia is uh, pretending to prepare for West 2029 before it pretended to prepare for West 2020 trainings. Uh, but never before since 2014-15, um, such an informational campaign blaming Ukraine for new aggression against some people in Donbas was presented in media. And of course, this is, a, let's say, a bad signal for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, uh, Dr. Cuso, now that Maria has um, in depth uh, offered her take on what may be the thinking in Ukraine and partly in Russia, can you please um, share your vision of what may be the Kremlin's logic, if any, and um, do you believe Russia will actually launch um, a military offensive into Ukraine, uh, or is this indeed an attempt to test the Western resolve? Um, you are on mute. You are on mute. Yes, I am. Um, I believe that Russia will not invade Ukraine. Um, and so I'm going to present a picture which is actually quite different from the previous speaker. And I'll do it by talking about primarily five points. Um, the, the first one I think we have to understand is that the peace process is finished. I mean, it was always never really going anywhere. I, I wrote a long piece in July of 2019 predicting that Zelensky would fail. The reason why um, any Ukrainian leader will fail to reach a peace agreement with Russia is, of course, because Putin is a mixture of former KGB, Russian chauvinist, and the mafiosi. He doesn't do compromises. Um, and the, um, the only, only thing that Ukraine could do to reach a, reach a kind of a peace deal with Vladimir Putin would be literally if a Ukrainian leader acted like Alexander Lukashenko. This is the only way Russia understands Ukraine. Ukraine is part of the Obshe Ruski Narod. Um, Ukraine is part of the old Russian nation. Uh, Ukraine is the central heartland of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world. Um, I disagree with the previous speaker about the disinformation campaign ongoing because this has been going, going for seven years now. Ukraine, people joke that the Russian, in the, on Russian TV, there's more about Ukraine than there is about Russia. Um, they, um, there's a very good book by Mik Mikhail Zegor came out in 2016 about the Putin and his circle. And he says that from day one of, that is 21 years ago, of Putin's presidency, he is obsessed with Ukraine. And I want to stress, he is literally obsessed with Ukraine. You cannot have a Ruski Mir, you cannot have a Russian world and that, um, without Ukraine. Um, so for me, this is, it makes it practically impossible unless literally a Ukraine leader puts his hands in the air or begins acting like Lukashenko for a peace deal to happen. Because there isn't really any grounds for compromise. Now, we have to understand that Zelensky would not have gone after Medvedchuk's three pro-Russian television channels if he really sincerely believed that he could do another deal with Putin. There's simply no way. So I think that Zelensky's playing games like I guess all foreign leaders and diplomats do, um, but I don't think Zelensky continues to believe that he can do a deal with, with uh, Putin. In this sense, 
history is like Groundhog Day. It's a repeated itself. Kuchma in 1994 also believed he could do a deal with Boris Yeltsin because the previous president was a nationalist, Krauchuk, Poroshenko, um, and, I, and I'm from Eastern Ukraine. Kuchma had the same problem with Yeltsin as Zelensky's had with Putin. So it's a deeper problem than even Putin. It's a Russian an inability to accept an independent Ukraine and the Ukraine, of course, outside the Russian sphere of influence. So that's the first, first, my first point. Let's forget about um, any idea of a peace agreement. It's not going to happen. And because Putin's president for life till 2036, this is going to continue for 15 more years. We'll have many more of these panels. The second, um, second point is why I don't think uh, an invasion will happen is that, let's get real, Ukraine is massive. It's a massive country. This is not Moldova or Georgia. Western experts say that it would take half of Russia's army to invade Ukraine. Invades one thing, occupying is another. Um, and it's not going to be that easy. Ukraine now, compared to seven years ago, has a decent army. It has territorial forces which would act as partisans. It, we would have, again, nationalist volunteer battalions. So this is not a cakewalk. This is not Georgia again or Moldova. You know, from Kishinev to Transnistria or from South Ossetia to Tbilisi is very close. From Donetsk to Kiev is 750 kilometers. It's, it's a big difference. Um, third point, um, if Russia invaded Ukraine, it would destroy its entire core disinformation program about the war. Russia has argued, of course, it's lying. In the last seven years, there are no Russian armed forces in Ukraine. What it means, Donbass, not Crimea, in Ukraine. And what's taking place, this is key in Russian propaganda, what's taking place is a civil war. You cannot continue to argue there are no Russian armed forces and it's a civil war if you invade Ukraine. Then it's game's over. This is a new, new different picture. So, and these two are very important for domestic and foreign, foreign audiences. The fourth question, what would be Russia's goals in invading? Um, yes, Putin is a very angry man. He should go on anger management classes. Um, and he's very obsessed with Ukraine. But the problem is Russians, I don't know of a single good Russian academic, analyst, politician in Moscow who actually understands Ukraine. There are more experts on Ukraine in Poland, England, United States than there are in Russia because they have so many stereotypes about Ukraine. They just don't understand the country. So what would be Russia's goals? Okay, you invade, you occupy, and then you do re regime change, like Russia wants to do in Georgia in 2008. But who do you put into power? What, Boyko? Medvedchuk? Are you serious? Um, Medvedchuk has less than 5% support. Boyko, I don't know, 15%. They would, it would be simple, you know, the problem is, is that putting a Lukashenko into power was impossible prior to 2014. And since 2014, it's even more impossible. Ukraine has changed. The, 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 the train has left the station. You can't rewind to pre-2014. Bloodshed has happened, war has happened. Um, you have 300, 400,000 veterans in Ukraine. So I, I think um, Russia is frustrated, um, but I, I don't see what Russia's political options are. You, you know, you can't put this Lukashenko into power. And if he tried, if Russian occupation forces tried, there would be a violent Maidan against Russia. Fifthly, what would be the impact of a Russian invasion? Domestically in Russia, it would increase opposition to Putin. Why? Because Russian, 85% of Russians support the annexation of Crimea. This is a figure from Levada Center. Only 10% don't oppose it. Navalny, who for some reason is a big hero in the West, supports the annexation of Crimea. But Navalny, like 
many Russians does not support Russian military aggression in eastern Ukraine. They see them as different. Crimea has a different place in Russian mentality to Donbass. And that's why most Russians believe their propaganda, their state propaganda, that what's taking place in Ukraine is a civil war. If Russia invaded, then Russia would be uh, fighting a war against brother Ukrainians. Russians believe still this, that Ukrainians are their brothers. Ukrainians no longer believe this, by the way, but Russians still do. How would Putin justify a war against brother Ukrainians, against the Russian world, against Nashi Ruski? Um, so I think that would galvanize and mobilize the opposition, um, Navalny and other people in Russia. And I think this would be a problem for Putin um, because this, this is a different ball game. Invading Eastern Ukraine is a different ball game to annexing Crimea, which was popular in Russia. Externally, I think this will be a disaster for Russia. I mean, you're talking about maybe a return to the Cold War of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, there would be panic station. There would be NATO would be moving troops to Poland, the Baltic states. This would be um, this would potentially open up doors of sanctions for for Putin that he would not want. Like, for example, going after the money of all the Russian kleptocrats, which is in the West, which until now, Western governments have not done. Um, and there could be other steps. Um, you know, the time to have done this against Ukraine was when Trump was in power, not when Biden's in power. I think that, and I'll finish here. I think that um, my talks in Kiev with various people have, have shown me of, of I've hinted at what I think Russia is, which direction it's going. And I think, that, uh, I think Russia has also really given up on doing a deal with Zelensky. So this is more about, you know, macho beating my chest, you know, Putin acting like Tarzan. Right, and what we, we see in Russia's steps towards Donbass are fivefold. Passportization since 2019, um, as in South Ossetia or Abkhazia. Secondly, um, a realization that Zelensky will not kind of crumble or, or, or do some, some bad compromise. You know, there was a, I think the Russians miss, I think Putin missed his opportunity with Zelensky, really did. Thirdly, uh, in January of this year, there was a, a, conf a, conven a conference, a convention in Donetsk of Ruski Donbass which talked about the need to annex um, DNR, LNR, Donbass. Fourthly, in February of this year, there was a Congress of a just, just, just Russia, Spravid Levy Russia, um, which is now planned to be the new Putin party of power to control those regions, so tighter integration into Russia. And there's a rumor that Putin is going to, in his State of the Nation address, recognize the independence of DNL LNR as he did with Abkhazia and South Ossetia in 2008. So I think, I, think that, I think I'm looking at it in a very different way. I think what Putin would love to do is not invade, but to repeat 2008 in Georgia, where um, this provo provocations from the separatist side leads to an overreaction from the Georgian or the Ukrainian side. And then, and then that gives Russia the excuse to come in and defend its so-called compatriots and punish Ukraine. Um, so I think it's more that, more uh, trying to repeat that than, than, um, than a full-scale invasion. But of course, Russia has the problem is that Zelensky is not Saakashvili. Uh, Zelensky is not Saakashvili. <laughs> He's nothing like him. Um, he's far more calmer. He's not you know, a loose cannon in that sense. So I don't think that Russia's plans will, will work. But Russia will continue, Russia, Putin's in power for 15 years. It means that he will continue to be obsessed and frustrated with Ukraine. Um, but the more that Russia does, like since 2014, the more, as always, Russia has pushing, has pushed and is pushing Ukraine away. And I just don't see 
how that's going to change um, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cuzio. What do you think the Western response should be to discourage these efforts now that we are in this situation that, uh, yeah, I mean, how, how the West can respond? Well, you know, there's, not a, there's of course um, military and non-military. I mean, the military side is of course more from NATO and the US. I think Ukraine's biggest military supporters have always been Canada, US, United Kingdom, Poland, the Baltic states. Um, so again, we're back to the question of military hardware, military equipment, training, and such like. Um, NATO um, uh, ensuring that it's defending its uh, members on, on the western borders of Ukraine. But I think on the non-military side, I think there's a lot more that could be done. I mean, the, um, uh, the West, is, as I mentioned, the West has never gone after Russian dirty money in the West. Um, and that surely is where you would hurt Putin. If Putin's criminal friends started to lose their money, which is hiding in London and Cyprus and Switzerland and elsewhere in Austria, then, then that would lead to pressure on Putin. So I think that's one aspect. I've also argued that, um, that the United States, maybe following on from Biden uh, calling Putin a killer, is that to threaten that if Russia invades, that Russia will be declared alongside Iran, Syria, and other countries, a terrorist state. Um, Russia has, Russian leaders, Putin the killer, have been poisoning and assassinating people for decades. So I think that would be part time. I, I, I think that the, those kind of areas are what would really hurt. And of course, one of the biggest financial uh, questions that's been always raised and threatened is removing Russia from SWIFT banking system. Um, this is where, you know, Putin, you know, because Putin's this mix of KGB, Russian chauvinist and mafiosno, mafiosny kleptocrat, you know, if you go after his money, then, then he has to back off. So I think th those areas are, are, are in some ways as important as the military side. Um, but I, um, I, I think it's more Putin without his shirt on pump, pumping his chest like Tarzan rather than um, some kind of likely plan to invade. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Cuiseau. And on your point regarding going after the um, uh, Russian money uh, and Ukrainian money, Ukrainian oligarchs' money in the West, there's uh, a new, as far as we know, anti-money laundering legislation uh, recently uh, enacted by the Congress, which hopefully mm -hmm. will make it more difficult to, for the Russian, Ukrainian, and other uh, tainted figures to hide their money in the U.S. democracy and other uh, democracies hopefully will follow. And there's one more question I wanted to point to, to address to both of our speakers. Um, uh, do you think Ukraine stands any chance of uh, receiving NATO membership action plan in the near future? Well, you, maybe Maria wants to go first. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think, Maria? Yes or no? Uh, rather no than yes. <laughs> but uh, but the question is that uh, action mem membership action plan is not uh, the the only and inevitable way to receive the membership at some point of time and actually the recently one of ukrainian think tanks have presented um really interesting research on how far how how quickly ukraine is implementing standards in uh, the army from defense point of view the nato standards and as of now the the let's say ukraine has implemented already 19% of uh, standards, though some current members of the NATO are still uh, demonstrating uh, worse, let's say, results. So this is, of course, a political issue. And um, what is important that the rhetoric of, um, for instance, current leadership of Ukraine uh, regarding NATO has, active, has uh, active, uh, have been activated exactly on the... Uh, in the light of uh, developments uh, with Russia. 
because um, uh, Ukrainian uh, um, Ukrainian politicians who are in 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 the office now, so I mean the office of the presidents, they start talking uh, about NATO and about membership as like the best way to guarantee the national sovereignty of Ukraine, without uh, those let's say loyal sympathies and without fear to to have some reaction on the side of Russia. The the problem which uh, took place for 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 instance, for these authorities previously, when they tried to play with some very soft rhetoric previously in 2019 and to first half of 2020. Now, even having uh, this deterioration in relations with Russia, they just make um, addresses and they appeal for support and uh, so confirm the aspirations. But um, that's, that's not the guarantee for aspiration for the, or receiving the, the membership action plan. So the, the better to show results first with the annual program of cooperation. Uh, and this is not the only one way to look for membership action plan. Thank you, Maria. Dr. Kuzo? I think um, an, in an interesting thing we could add to this, uh, this I mean, I, I, I agree that that would be an incredible signal to send to Russia if Ukraine joins the a, a, a MAP, a Membership Action Plan, because you could be in the MAP for 20 years. I mean, there is no fixed time period for when you're in a MAP. But I think uh, what's important is, um, is, to, is to note that, um, is to reject um, the ar argument that because a part of your territory is occupied, that prevents you joining. And the way to do this is by saying, well, in, in, in 1949, West Germany had part of its territory occupied by the Soviet Union. Uh, it's called the GDR. And yet West Germany was allowed to join NATO and the European Union. So there's a precedent for a country um, being allowed to join NATO, even though some of its territory is occupied. And of course, Cyprus was allowed to join the EU with, with Northern Cyprus occupied by Turkey. Um, but I think the big, big issue here, which um, is, well, there are two issues, I think. Firstly, it's unclear to me why NATO lets in countries like, like Montenegro or Macedonia, who don't really contribute m hardly anything to NATO's military strength, and, and yet they, they uh, desist from Ukraine, which would bring a lot to the NATO table. I mean, not only uh, military, but also expertise in hybrid warfare and also a military industrial complex. Um, and I think the other question we should, th we should throw in here is to what, again, we should thank Vladimir Putin for this, is the way, the degree to which Ukraine has changed and how support for NATO has increased. I mean, as you know, as Maria knows from democratic initiatives and other opinion polls, um, the Ukrainians who are participating in the NATO referendum in, Ukra in Ukraine um, would vote in favor of membership in the region of anything between 55 and 69%, different opinion polls. That's higher, that's a higher, higher rate of support than many members of NATO who come from Eastern Europe, like Hungary and Slovenia. So the, the, the old argument that NATO, NATO used to make saying that we can't bring Ukraine in because in, into NATO because there's, there's no support for, you, for NATO membership is now gone. Um, and so I think there's the, the, the pluses are far greater than the minuses in, in doing that. Um, and, and we should, and again, if NATO really wants to stop this continued every, you know, every year, these kind of provocations and military buildups and such like, which will continue as long as Putin is in power and he's in power for life, at least till 2036, when they'll probably change the constitution again, then, then the good way to do that is by bringing Ukraine into a membership action plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuzo. And we have quite a bit of quite a lot of questions from the audience, and we can now open the floor to the audience. And thank you for, to our speakers for agreeing to stay with us a little longer. And um, I'll start with the first question coming from uh, Susan Stewart. 
could the speakers address the question of the militarization of Crimea? How does this and the new introduction of Russian ships into the Black Sea recently fit into the developments concerning the Donbas? How are they connected and what might uh, they mean for Russia's intervention uh, or intentions in the coming weeks? Uh, so I would say that what was going in Crimea uh, since beginning of uh, the year uh, was to some extent hidden by maneuvers around Donbass. Because in my opinion, all their public attention and all the actual attention of uh, created by or provoked by, by the media bo from both sides, from Ukrainian uh, media side and from Russian ones also, uh, all the attention was put on what is going along the border between Ukraine and Russia and in temporary occupied Donbas. But at the same time, uh, almost nothing about what was going in Crimea, though in Crimea there were also redislocations and Crimea has, um, ex um, uh, to Crimea there were sent uh, troops uh, much more, let's say, um, 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 appropriate for some kind of operations than in uh, th than, than those who are gathered along the uh, Russian and Ukrainian border. But at the same time, Crimea, in my opinion, is um, not the um, suitable. Though Russia is interested in the, in the war from the Dnieper River, uh, nevertheless, in my opinion, so that's that, that's pretty un uncomfortable, let's say, the starting point to start any kind of aggression from that side, um, only if some local um, attacks on the sea, like we have already had one in Azov Sea, something in the, uh, on the, on the water, on, on the sea, something might happen, but uh, using like uh, the, the the operation on the ground, this is less possible than something organized in temporary occupied territories. Because we have to understand that if there is some local operation, by the way, there is no contradiction between um, my opinion and, and Taras. <laughs> uh, that, because I also see that the full-fledged military aggression is less still possible than some local operations. But we still should consider and this scenario as well. So only in this point, we are different uh, with our evaluations and assessments. But yeah, the, thank you. Thank you very much. We have to stop soon okay. enough. So please yeah, make your, I mean, uh, finalize your point and then we can go on to other questions if possible. Uh, so the developments in last weeks, they were nothing new because the militarization of Crimea has started much more earlier than current developments along the uh, border with Ukraine. But at the same time, I don't believe that any operations on the ground from Crimea starting point will be implemented. Thank you. Um, we have a number of questions right now. So uh, I suggest that I read them in, uh, in groups and then uh, our speakers can address those questions that they uh, that they believe are most um, relevant to, to the discussion or uh, the ones they can address best. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Dirk uh, Mayheisen. Uh, Putin does not fear Ukraine other than wanting to limit the West's response to his aggression. What does Putin fear that could change his behavior? Could Russian domestic conditions limit Putin more than reactions to his actions towards Ukraine? Is, uh, in other words, uh, is uh, time on Ukraine's side? There's also a question from uh, Jonas uh, Juhl from, um, uh, from Denmark. Uh, is there a risk of a smaller invasion with a tailored narrative, uh, namely specific parts of Donbass? There's also a question from William Courtney, and that's the one for Taras Kuzio. Uh, what are the uh, proximate reasons why Russia is, not, uh, is now scaring Ukraine? Medvedchuk sanctioning, need for water uh, concessions for Crimea, other reasons. Uh, I think we'll, we'll stop here and then we'll go on to the next round of questions. Uh, do you um, want me to? to yeah, mind? sure, sure. Um, I, you know, when, when we talk about time being on Ukraine's side, we're back to the same myth that we've had for the th last 30 years, that somehow um, when a new generation arrives, then they'll be more liberal. Well, that's been proven not to be true. 
Um, if you look at opinion polls in Russia, for example, about attitudes to Joseph Stalin, young people in Russia today now have the same views as their older, older generation because they've had 20 years of the rehabilitation of Stalin under Putin. So the idea that somehow young people are more likely to be less aggressive, less nationalistic, I think is a, is a misnomer. Um, yes, um, uh, Navalny, um, uh, Navalny supporters are middle-class Russians from urban centers, but that's never going to be enough for Navalny to win a Russian election if it was a free election. Um, and uh, the reality is, is that the majority of Russians believe that Ukraine is Russian and that Ukrainians are a part of the Russian people. That is uh, a reality. Now, that doesn't mean to say that every Russian or every Russian politician wants to launch a military invasion of Ukraine. People around Yeltsin also believe that, but they didn't do any military aggression against Ukraine. But, um, but those kind of views in Russia are very deep. And the, uh, I've just completed a book um, for Routledge this year called Russian Nationalism and the Russian-Ukrainian War. And, and I look at Russian emigres, uh, uh, late Soviet period, 1990s. Um, you know, it's the same problem. Russians can't get over the fact that Ukraine wants to be an independent state and wants to be separate from Russia's sphere of influence. This is nothing new. Putin did not invent this. Um, all, all that Putin did was radicalize this. And he's the first one to adopt military aggression, as it were. Because Ukraine had a separatist problem in the 90s in Crimea, but Yeltsin didn't send troops there to support the separatists. Putin did. So I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Um, and to be honest, uh, most Ukrainians are rightly disappointed by Navalny for actually not being critical about, critical enough about Putin's military aggression against Ukraine. Navalny himself has said Ukrainians and Russians are one people. I mean, you know, so there you are. Um, on, um, on the smaller invasion theme, yes, I mean, of course, I mean, this is back to the Georgian scenario of 2008. Um, a, a smaller invasion could, for example, re could occupy uh, the whole of Donbass, so expand the territory of the DNR and LNR from a third of Donbass to all of Donbass. It could try that, of course. That could be one alternative. But you're still going back to the same problems I raised that then you can no longer say it's a civil war. You can no longer say that there are no Russian troops in Ukraine and you, can, you cannot deny what's taking place to your own Russian public. So um, I, I, think, I think Putin's, the reason why Putin's a very angry man is that his options are limited with the Ukraine. Um, he's frustrated by Ukraine. And he'll continue to be frustrated because, you know, uh, a Ukraine in the Russian world was not a possibility prior to 2014. And since 2014, and the, the more bloodshed you have, the more people die, the more veterans you have, then this is impossible. So Putin's actions are making Ukraine, as it were, not go in the direction he wants. I mean, for example, the reason 16% of Ukraine's voters who were traditionally pro-Russian are living in Russian-occupied territories, which is the reason why pro-Russian forces in Ukraine can never come to power. One of the major reasons. But that's because of Putin's actions. So I, I think that... Um, yeah, I mean, there's going to be there's good, because Putin's in power for till till he dies, basically. Um, then there's going to continue to be these kind of provocations and military buildups and threats of intervention and this that, and the other and maybe terrorist attacks inside Ukraine um, and other antics. But um, but you but for all intents and purposes, Ukraine is lost to Russia. Um. 
Dr. Kso, thank you very much. Yeah, we will have to continue with the with the uh, remaining questions. Uh, there's a question from Alexandra Butli. Um, Zelensky is probably unlikely to overreact, but would army listen to him and hold from overreacting? It seems that there's a chance that uh, army leadership uh, and volunteers might act in a stronger way than authorities would like them to. What do you think about this? Then there's a question from uh, Gavin Stark. Um, this is the one for uh, Dr. Kuzo, and I'll shorten the question. It boils down to how desperate is the Kremlin for nationalist fervor to dispel popular support for Navalny? Um, and there's also a question from Doug Klein. Uh, this isn't the same situation we had in 2014, but what do you think uh, are the key lessons that the Biden uh, administration learned from the U.S. response to Russia's invasion? Then how might he act differently if Russia escalates today? Um, and we will have the last round of questions as soon as you answer these ones. The floor is yours. Oh, Terrence and Maria. Okay. And um, we have we are really limited on time, so please yeah, limit yeah, yeah, okay. to like okay. 30 I, seconds. I, 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 don't think the, I, I don't think the military will overreact. I think the Ukraine military, uh, remember, there are no more volunteer battalions. They were all, in, all integrated in 2015 into the military or into the National Guard. So even, for example, the Azov regiment is, is you know, it listens to commands. It, 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 I don't think that's likely, to be honest. Um, on the question of uh, nationalist fervor in Russia, of course, Russia is a, is a hyper-nationalist state. But I go back to my point that for Russians, um, for most Russians, um, not for the crazy nationalist wing, but for most Russians, the Donbass is not Crimea. Um, and you know, it's, there's no question that majority of Russians still continue to support annexation of Crimea, but Donbass, they want to believe the myth that this is a civil war. And a, an invasion and in a Ukrainian-Russian full-scale war destroys the myth of a civil war. Um, so I, 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 don't think, I don't think Putin can, can um, mobilize a nationalist fervor on Donbass in the same way as he could on Crimea in 2014. It's very different. Just quick, last thing on Biden. I'm sorry, but Biden was terrible um, when he was under Obama. Uh, the Obama administration betrayed Ukraine in 2014. United States, United Kingdom were co-signatures of the Budapest Memorandum, and they completely forgot that in 2014. The Biden administration vetoed the sending of military equipment, that includes uh, Obama and Biden, vetoed the sending of military equipment to Ukraine. So Ukrainians have a terrible view of the Obama administration, of which Biden was a member then. Now, of course, Biden is a different person today. It's a different era. Ironically, it was the Trump administration that allowed military equipment to go to Ukraine, not the Obama administration. Thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, we move on to, to other questions. There's a question from Matya Neles. He's asking, uh, is there anything, um, that, anything else Ukraine could do to improve conditions for its citizens living in the occupied territories? Uh, there's a question about uh, from Vince Morelli about Ukraine fatigue, supposedly uh, on the part of the EU. Uh, he's saying uh, since 2014, it seems Putin had countered on uh, counted on Ukraine fatigue on the part of the EU, and that he could wait uh, out the EU patience. If Dr. Kuzo is correct that we may have 15 more years of this, and if Zelensky uh, can. Um, uh, cannot offer a peace agreement, has the EU settled in for a long haul uh, stalemate? Could anything change the EU uh, perspective? Uh, there's a question from Connor uh, O'Kelly. What is the current attitude of the Ukrainian people regarding the effectiveness of Zelensky's negotiation attempts? Um, and finally, there are two questions from uh, Keith uh, uh, Condon and uh, Victor Rood. Uh, Keith is asking if the US sanctions uh, Putin's uh, associate. Uh, if the US sanctions Putin's associates, uh, would this not remove the imperative for Russia to not invade Ukraine, thus removing an um, impediment to future aggression? And the question from Victor Root: What will it take to wake the West sufficiently so it moves away from a purely reflexive response mode and take measures to turn Putin inward? Um, and finally, uh, there's one more coming uh, from Catherine uh, um, Bogman. Uh, is there any way to make, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, 
that's a technical one that is not important to, to the discussion. It's a, it's, it's a technical one we'll address separately. Yes, so um, uh, who would like to, to address these questions that okay. I um, named? I, and I, I, again, I, we have 30 seconds for each, uh, Max. Okay, uh, starting with the question from Mat Matia um, about uh, if Ukraine can do something. No, Ukraine has done nothing uh, because uh, everything, the, uh, I mean, for the ordinary people in uh, temporary occupied territories, as of now, all the checkpoints on the side of Ukraine are open, but only one point on the side of so-called republics is open and uh, uh, allow the movement of the people. Humanitarian humanitarian uh, assistance is uh, going through the division line and the cross um, Christ, um, uh, Red Cross um, uh, um, uh, humanitarian mission is working and sending humanitarian assistance to people there, but nothing else, unfortunately. Uh, about uh, there was important question about the attitudes and how people um, react to Zelensky's uh, attempts to solve the conflict. So um, recently, at the end of February, we in Democratic Initiatives Foundation uh, conducted important poll at the checkpoints. So we po we, we polled people who are moving through the only one working work a checkpoint between temporary occupied territories and uh, frontline government control areas and it's interesting that there the um, public opinion was almost equally divided like 30 percent and 27 percent respectively uh, for the idea that uh, Zelensky is trying to freeze the conflict and preserve the status quo as it is uh, and 27 percent for the idea that he is trying to reintegrate the territories but um, our qualitative research in the conflict affected areas show that people got used to live in the uh, in the, um, the conditions of the conflict and uh, as of as of now they just um, to some extent those who was uh, agreed um, who agreed to the peace at any price are disappointed with Zelensky politics and policy because he didn't bring that peace but he can't and as of now, the general idea of um, the office of the president is to play with some kind of revision of the Minsk agreements, though this also will not be successful. Uh, Dr. Kusso, would you like to to um, comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think um, international organizations like the European Union or even governments uh, um, ever think of things in the long term. So they don't, they're, not, they're never going to plan you know, at, uh, policies towards Russia and Ukraine uh, for the next 15 years, as long as Putin's in power. I mean, they don't think, they don't act like that. So the EU keeps re keeps reviewing the sanctions every six months. Um, but, you know, the EU, I'm British, so I, I don't really think much of the EU as a foreign policy actor. Um, so, but, uh, but I think that, um, you know, Putin has been supporting the far right in Europe as a way to end the sanctions, because the far right is quite pro-Russian in, in Europe. Um, but I think he's failed on that because uh, the far right are, in, are not, not completely in power everywhere. And, um, you know, we have the irony of Germany where the most anti-Putin party are the Greens in Germany. So um, I think on the question of Ukrainian people, to me, what's fascinating is the degree to which um, views of Russia and Russian policies, which until 2014 were only found in West Ukraine, are now the majority. Um, so, for example, something you always find something like 70% of Ukrainians think that uh, their country is at war with Russia. I mean, that, and, and even today, a new opinion poll uh, only 12% believed that um, Russia could never invade Ukraine. So, only 12%. Two thirds, sixty-seven percent thought yes, this is a possibility. That shows you to what degree Ukrainians have changed. I think that I don't think I think when it came to the peace process, I think Ukrainians blame Russia more than they blame Zelensky um, for for the failure, because they I think they kind of most of them recognize. I mean, I may be wrong here, but most of them recognize that Zelensky has tried and that the main ag main aggression is coming coming from 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 Russia. Um, so I, I think that I think Zelensky can can, can can kind of spin that to his own benefit that he can blame the other side on, on this. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Cuseo. And I would like to ask you to make your final thoughts since we're pressed on time and we'll be um, wrapping up soon. Uh, Maria, would you like to start? Okay, so we, we shouldn't expect any progress in negotiations, though there, there are attempts, and though I think that the, the, the last proposals from, uh, from our Normandy partners were normal or, let's say, adequate starting point for negotiations, but no progress uh, is hardly to be achieved in the nearest future, just simply because uh, approaches of two parties are completely different still, and um, no flexibility we see in the position of Russia. At the same time, I expect uh, the escalation uh, exactly in Donbas, and if some local op and uh, some um, um, local operations uh, can happen, first of all, there, uh, because um, um, Russia doesn't need to justify its presence. It's simply they're simply there already in thought of the Donbas, and at the same time, they can pretend that this is not Russian troops, but uh, so-called rebels or the army forces of um, so-called DPR and LPR. And what is also important, they have the support from uh, medical hospitals, which is also needed if you organize any operations. So that's why um, the, the probability that uh, some aggression happen, um, it is higher when it comes to temporary occupied territories of Donbas. Uh, Ukraine shouldn't uh, try to make a compromise under the pressure of these risks because there is simply no guarantees for any, let's say, um, prolongation of even the ceasefire. And moreover, for further development of negotiations, whenever they will be, they will be um, renovated, uh, um, uh, renewed. Uh, um, Ukraine can use diplomatically the fact how easy Russia has withdrawn from the ceasefire and how simple was the way and short one from this, let's say, ceasefire, even not stable one, to full-fledged escalation, which is really probable. And that's why the um, insistence on the security first approach can be used by Ukrainian side to demand, let's say, from uh, Normandy format, more uh, focus exactly on this idea. Thank you, Maria. And Dr. Kuzo, your final thoughts, please. Um, I have far less uh, um, optimism about the Normandy format. For me, it's a, it's a structure that and makes absolutely no sense at all. Firstly, you have the aggressor country as pretending to be a peacemaker. I mean, which is bizarre. Uh, the fact that Russia is in the Normandy format reinforces Russia's claim that this is a civil war in Ukraine and it's not involved. Russia should not be there. I mean, you know, it's probably impossible to take it out now. But I think what, what, um, what should happen um, is that I think two countries which provided security assurances to Ukraine under the Budapest Memorandum, United Kingdom and United States, should become part of the Normandy format. Um, otherwise, um, to be quite frank, what was the point of Ukraine giving away the world's third nuclear weapons? Because Ukraine, most Ukrainians believe the Budapest Memorandum was a useless, worthless piece of paper. So at least I think that would be a good way to um, maybe reinvigorate the Normandy format, because the problem as it is now is that the Ukrainians don't trust the French. I don't trust the French. Um, and they often have a pro-Russian viewpoint. On the question of uh, the Donbass, I think, I think, um, I think the, the likelihood of a peace deal is gone. I think Russia missed the opportunity to do a, a very good compromise, which would maybe have been in Russia's favor with Zelensky in 2019 and maybe early 2020. But, the, but that's typical for Russia. You know, the, Russia is good at transforming politicians who are not anti-Russian like Kuchma and Zelensky into those who are critical of Russia. That's typical of Russia. Um, but I think what was happening is, is that we're going to see in the next year or so, and maybe quite soon, a, a, a movement towards a, a creeping slow occu Russian occupation of Denel, Dener and LNR. And I think, uh, I think that's the way forward. So kind of, um, 
what we see taking place in Abkhazia and South Ossetia um, since 2008. And the reason for that is that um, Russia did not annex uh, these territories in 2014 because Putin's alternative idea was that they join Ukraine and become a center of pro-Russian influence inside Ukraine. If that's no longer possible, as I don't think it is, um, then, then, then the alternative is for it to be slowly um, kind of brought under greater Russian control. On a final point, the one reason why Zelensky wouldn't be too, Zelensky would not be that unhappy with this. Why? Well, because Zelensky serving to the People Party and Zelensky himself as a presidential candidate does not want to be able to compete with these pro-Russian voters in Eastern Ukraine. Um, so um, I, I think, you know, the reason why Putin wanted these areas to go back to Ukraine was so that pro-Russian voters go back to Ukraine. Well, that's the reason why Zelensky and many others don't want them to go back. So I, I think we're going to see a creeping, as it were, occupation um, and integration of these areas into Russia. Thank you. Thank you, Taras. Um, and um, yeah, there's no doubt that Ukraine's ability to counter the Russian aggression is very much dependent on Western support. Therefore, we, we believe this discussion was very important in terms of on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, in terms of giving us a better picture of, uh, of uh, the nature of this escalation and potential solutions for Ukraine. Uh, having said that, uh, we understand that the West alone cannot guarantee our security. It is therefore critical that uh, Ukraine also delivers uh, on its commitments by implementing the key rule of law reforms, anti-corruption defense reforms, and the long list of reforms that have been stalled for quite some time. And, and this will definitely uh, help it move towards uh, EU and NATO membership. Um, many thanks to our outstanding speakers. Thanks so much to our audience for joining us today. Um, Please stay in touch with us and please follow our experts, our speakers on their respective platforms and have a nice and safe weekend. Over to you, Jonathan. Um, just to thank our speakers again too for this discussion um, and thank you for staying over time to our speakers because I know we've gone way over um, over time, but and all the questions, if we didn't get to them, uh, feel free to follow up with us. We're happy to try to connect you both to the speakers or to address any questions. And we look forward to our next conversation and also Everybody have a good weekend as well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.